The most interesting thing I do, it would be seeing things turn yellow. It's a bit silly to say, but it all brings on to that because that's how you see things work. Hello, and welcome again to the Pathways podcast, where we explore different careers in the Quebec City region. I'm your host, Susanna Tang from Voice of English Speaking Quebec. Today, I'll be speaking with Jan Becker about his career as a PhD candidate in biomedical research. Jan holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Cell Biology and Physiology, along with two Master's degrees. The first in Molecular Pathophysiology and the second in Microbiology and Immunology. He is in the final stages of completing his PhD in Molecular Medicine and is currently working on research to help treat patients with systemic lupus erythematosus. Okay, so first of all, I want to know, did you always have an interest in science? I guess I did. Actually, since I was a kid, I wanted to do something related to health science. So a medical doctor or a researcher. My father was a cardiologist and my mother had a training as a nurse. It gave me some interest in biology and everything related to medical sciences. So I think it all stems from there. But I guess you decided to go more towards the researcher and less towards the MD. I found that some of my interests in science could be achieved better and I could get closer to this interest by being a researcher. So I choose this path. But my personal career choice is really in the threshold between research and uh, medical science. Though Yan opted not to become a doctor, he is still able to contribute to the medical field through his research. He works in an area called translational science where they use the data gathered from their experiments to directly impact patient health. Listen as Yan explains this further. My personal job is to look at things that are present in the blood from patients. So the samples were provided by the medical team. And I look for the presence or the absence of several molecules, let's say antibodies, that are in this patient's blood. And I use this data to correlate, so I associate the presence or the absence of these molecules with medical history of these patients. So I'm looking for things that are not known at the moment and not uh, yet widely accepted in medical science, but I have to use data from patients, so elements from the medical field. Right. So you're saying that there's this theoretical part, but then there's this application part where you're actually taking the theory and trying to put it into practice to see if it's effective, I guess. Exactly. Um, Maybe now we can dig in further with your research. So you were talking about finding the presence of something. Maybe we can talk a little bit more about what that something is. Of course. So I work on a disease with a a very uh, difficult name. It's called systemic lupus erythematosus. It's what's called an autoimmune disease. So it's a disease in which the defense of the body turns against the body. So the patient's uh, defense system, the immune system, basically betrays him and destroys slowly his body. So that's what the the diseases do. And this disease is mediated by the presence of a specific molecule, which is called an antibody. So my whole project is to look at antibodies that recognize the mitochondrion. The mitochondrion provides the cell with energy and controls several other of the cellular function. The catch is that the mitochondrion is a former bacterium. So it has specific patterns that are recognized by the immune system that comes from the bacterial world. So I want to know if in these patients with SLE, so systemic lupus erythematosus, if these patients have antibodies against the mitochondrion, as mitochondria may uh, be released from the cells when cells die or when some cells are activated, as it's seen in SLE, where it, they can be recognized by the immune system. And so then, what's the purpose of your research? Actually, the whole purpose of my research is to create novel assays, so blood tests that allows 
to detect the presence or the absence or the quantity of uh, antibodies targeting mitochondria. Eventually, and what we hope is that the presence or the levels of antibody within the patient's blood can be associated to uh, symptoms that they express. So if we can assess the presence of these antibodies before they express the symptom, we can actually treat them in advance and actually maybe prevent damages that can be done by the disease. So it also breaks down as improving the patient care and their quality of life. Wow, that's incredible. To be able to track and potentially prevent the progression of symptoms would radically transform patient outcomes. Next, I asked Yan to identify the most interesting things he does at work. Basically, what excites me the most is when I assess the presence of the antibody in the patient's blood. I do an assay that I measure because it provides color. It does color. So to explain that, if in my assay patient has antibodies, it will turn yellow, basically. And I measure how yellow is this yellow to see how much antibodies does this patient have. Other than that, publishing, showing your data and representing your work. That's basically the most interesting part of my job. Right. Publishing. When you do research, there's no point in keeping the results to yourself. The whole point is to share them. First, by publishing them in recognized scientific or academic journals. And then by presenting your research at conferences. Here, Yan tells us more about the conference presentation. You have two common ways of presenting your results there. Either you present them in a poster, or you may have an oral presentation. When you get an oral presentation, you know your data are really interesting for your field. So it's very frightening at first. Then you get to know the people that work in your field. You do some networking to meet new people, to have questions asked that press your research further on. Where have you presented your paper? Last year, I had several occasions to present my work. I went to Manchester in the United Kingdom and to Atlanta in Georgia, United States. So the biggest one, obviously, was in Georgia, in, uh, in Atlanta. Uh, I was at the American uh, College of Rheumatology, which is top-notch circle for rheumatologists and people working on this field which is my, uh, my case, thousands of people working in science or in medicine or pharmacy or any related fields. It was huge. But I'd say my favorite time was in Manchester. It was for a smaller congress on a specific disease, which is called antiphospholipid syndrome. Here you had basically a couple hundred person, which is quite a few still. And it was more personal, more intimate. Uh, you get to know people from a smaller field. It was really, really fun to meet this all, all these new people, all these researchers, these students. And you can get a bit more intimate and the networking is way easier. Let's move on to language. How often do you use English in your work and in what capacity? The universal language for science is English. I have to use English every day, either to read scientific paper to keep up with the state of arts in my field, or when I write my own paper, when I have to, you know, interact with my peers, comes from other countries that sometimes are not even English-speaking or French-speaking countries. Every interaction you may have outside of the lab is in English, so you get to use it on the daily. You don't have to have a perfect English or a perfect accent or anything, but you have in some way to understand and have a decent English. And we also have some kind of training we do at the lab because Every two weeks, we present our latest results in what we call a laboratory meeting. 
and uh, during these lab meetings, we only speak in English. So it's like, basically, we act as if we were presenting our data uh, in an international meeting, an international congress that can help you to be at ease with expressing yourself in English. That's a great idea. Wow. Uh, I want to know a little bit about, are there some other things that you've done outside of just your studies or the work in a lab? What else have you done to contribute to your professional growth? Oh, uh, lots. Actually, since 2008, I've continuously been in several associations related to health or to education. So this contributes to, I think, my view as a scientist in the society. I also worked as a um, scientific animator. So I did uh, workshops and extracurricular uh, science activities for kids from 8 to 15 years old. And actually, the, it helped me to learn how to express and to explain science to people that are not trained in science or not yet trained, obviously. It's like everything. When you love something, you, you're, you do it every day, every time. Uh, so I'm a scientist. A scientist 24-7, actually. So I talk science to people. Uh, for instance, during the COVID-19 crisis, I try to explain what happens with the virus, what's the big deal with the masks, with the uh, the drugs uh, trial you may have heard of and everything. So basically, keeping one foot in science every time and having one foot outside of it Actually, it helps me being a better scientist, I guess. Great point. Yan reminds us that the things we do outside of work can actually help us do our jobs better because they offer other ways of seeing, knowing, and doing. So, do you have what it takes to be a scientist? Here is Yan's list of the qualities of a good researcher. I think the main quality is curiosity. You have to keep an open mind about things. Sometimes you will have results that don't go the way you plan. So you have to deal with them. You have to be truthful too. You can't hide data. You shouldn't hide data that doesn't go in the way that uh, supports your theory. Another great quality to have is to be thorough. You have to do things exactly the same because you need your data to be reproducible. The more thorough you are, the more reproducible you can get. So I think that's the main qualities to have as a researcher. So often we hear that it's very difficult to obtain a tenured professor position at a university. Is that the direction you're trying to go? And do you find that it's going to be a very uh, big challenge? For sure, it's a really big challenge because there is a saying in French, il y a beaucoup d'appelés et peu d'élus. So uh, there are lots of candidates, uh, but very few people that are successful. It's below 10% of the PhD student that may get their own lab. So yes, it is hard to be a tenured professor and to have an academic career. But it's very uh, rewarding. It's very interesting. So something that I often say to people is that there are three main things that make a good researcher. You have some kind of genius. So some innate qualities in your field. Also have to work hard to achieve your goal and to develop your lab or just your CV. And you also have to be lucky in some way, because sometimes you have this very good work hypothesis that doesn't work. And it's just bad luck because it's as hard as any other theory, but it doesn't work. And sometimes you will have a theory that would work really, really well. Or sometimes you, if you are clever and thorough, you may have odd results and turn them around to achieve new results. All these elements impact your career. But 
I think my main uh, message and my take home message there is that there are other careers available. You know, there are lots of private agencies that can hire you as a researcher. There are biomedical laboratories, the private sector that uh, always looks for new talents. You can write books, you can work on TV, you can work in the government in several levels, you can do a lot of things other than being a tenured professor. And none of this work are worse or better than another. You just have to find what suits you. Final question. Finish the sentence. My job is awesome because... My job is awesome because actually when you publish, you leave a mark in scientific history. And that's all for this episode. Thank you again to our guest, Yan Becker, for sharing his thoughts and insights. We would also like to acknowledge the Government of Canada for funding this initiative. Join us next time for our talk with Maxime Renaud and Jennifer Fortin about their work at Industrielle Alliance an insurance company. This is the Pathways Podcast, signing off until next time.